Koopa, what are you doing in here? Close the door, Cobb, you goon. I'm working on my top secret plans to go forward in time to watch Tenet, which just had his release date pushed back again. Go forward in time? But Koopa, we did that last time, and it didn't work. Mm, yeah, you got a point. But what else we gonna do, Cobb? Watch Kissing Booth 2 on Netflix again? I ain't that desperate. Joey King is a treasure. A treasure, I tell you. Cobb, you scared me again. But anyhow, we got a backup plan anyway. We sneak on to Christopher Nolan's yacht and persuade him to show us the movie right then and there. So you want us to hijack Christopher Nolan's yacht in the middle of a pandemic? Just to get a free screening of Tenet? Cooper, it's just a movie. It's not just a movie, you big goon. It's a cinematic event. You got me there, Coop. <sighs> Alright, Cobb. We made it. We're on Christopher Nolan's yacht, and we just took out the last of the gods. Yeah, that was pretty difficult and time-consuming. Anyway, I don't think that one guy's gonna make it. Quiet, Cobb. I see him right there in the screening room. It's Chris Nolan, and he's watching Kissing Booth 2. Ooh, I love that part. Stay right where you are, celebrate our tour director, Christopher Nolan. Cobb, tie him down real good. But Cooper, we don't have any rope. Ooh, just use that 70 millimeter film reel right over there. Okay, I'm on it. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so 70 millimeter 35 for the shot. Oh, yeah, yes. We ain't gonna hurt you, your majesty. Just sit real tight and tell us where the film reel for Tenet is. We're gonna watch it right now. And you got like popcorn, a bunch of crunch or something? Yeah, all I see here are granola bars and labels where chairs used to be. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so Anne Hathaway's uh, the path forward, never path back. Wait a minute, Cooper. The film reel for Tenet isn't even here. Oh, he must really be worried about those spoilers. No, you idiot. It's not here because it doesn't even exist. Not even Christopher Nolan has seen Tenet yet. Christopher Nolan? Is this true, Your Honor? So, the cinematic uh, landscape always changing studio rights, intellectual property, and such. Cooper, I can't understand a goddamn word he's saying. It's just like when I'm watching one of his movies. Hey, you're right, Cooper. I, I mean, Cobb, hearing him talk is just as good as watching one of his movies, even. Well, maybe, yes, uh, Wally Fister, he decided to, 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 for sure. And then it is the picture of Tenet in theater soon. Let's just stay with him, Cobb. That way we can experience his movies all the time for real. Forever. No, so, 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 that's his ideas, yes, as films, windows of the soul and such. Wait a minute, Cooper. What, what if this is it? What if we're in the movie? Or even the movie within the movie? Ah, Cobb, you're making my noggin ache. You caught up in your dreams, lost sight of your realities. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. He, he's starting to say things I understand, Cooper. I think... I think he's learning how to dumb himself down for us. Oh, great. It's the third act of Interstellar all over again. But you're right, Cobb. We just need to hang out here on the yacht for a few days until Chris for Nolan starts talking to us in complete sentences. Here, let's pass the time with one of his DVDs. Out of sight. Nah, he ain't got that one. We got, uh, let's see, George the Jungle, Dudley Do-Right... Encino Man, Inconvenient Truth, Laquisha, Grown Ups 2, Clouds of Sils Maria. Oh wait, how about this one? Yeah, Big Mama's House too. Let's watch it. Right, uh, PG-13 pants need to know this movie pushes the PG-13 envelope most often at the expense of female bodies. Welcome once again to Cinemaholics. I'm John Negroni, box office columnist for Adam Tickets, staff writer for the young folks, and head writer of Cinemaholics.com. And with me, he is the pop culture writer for Cinema Blend. And he also reviews films for Cinemaholics. How you doing, Malashin? I'm okay. How you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. And, you know, we have a big review this week that yeah. you are in. And no, I just no want to... I don't want to waste any time. We have mm -hmm. to tell the listeners, they looked at the, the name of this episode. It says an American Pickle. We are going to review that film. However, there is a huge bias because Will is the star of the movie. Uh, but we're going to do our best to review it objectively. I don't know if we will succeed. Yeah. That's it. You can find more episodes of Cinemaholics, including our full archive on cinemaholics.com. 
Be sure to write into the show if you would like to send us an email. Cinemaholicspodcast at gmail.com is how you do that. And as always, we invite you to consider becoming one of our monthly patrons on patreon.com slash cinemaholics. We appreciate all of your support to help keep our podcast going. And with that, we just have a couple of off topics, and then we are going to get into the movies of the week. The movies this week, like we said before, include An American Pickle, which is now streaming on HBO Max. We're also going to be talking about David Ayer's new film, The Tax Collector, a uh, L.A. crime thriller, who would have guessed from David Ayer. And then last, an interesting VOD release called Waiting for the Barbarians, which pretty excited to hear you talk about that film, Will. I'm very curious how it went over. Before we get into these reviews, first we have to get into a couple of off topics, not a lot this week. First off, we have Extra Milestone. This week's film anniversary celebrated on the feed is Gene Dealman. Uh, I'm not going to say the entire name of that because <laughs> my French is terrible, um, but yes, Gene Dealman from the wonderful Chantal Ackerman. Host Sam Noland on the Extra Milestone series invited Julia Tady a beloved friend of the show to talk about that film in depth. It's a really great conversation. Uh, Sam and I were actually having a conversation about some of our favorite extra milestone episodes, and he is already holding Gene Dealman in the highest regard. I think he has it as his number two film discussed since we started extra milestone last year. That's very high praise. Yes. We've done so so many great episodes, but yes, I I've listened to that episode already and he and Julia have a really insightful conversation about that film, which is a difficult watch. If you don't know anything about it, I highly recommend our listeners go check it out. You can see it right now. Actually, I believe it's available on YouTube. And if I'm not mistaken, Criterion channel has the film as well. And if you want to watch in anticipation of this week's extra milestone film anniversary, I'm going to be discussing, finally, La Dolce Vita, one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, this is the Federico Fellini 1960 film. And Sam just watched this film for the first time a couple of months ago. He and I are going to finally discuss the film together, which we had really been hoping to do. We were considering doing this film in the spring, but because it has different release windows, we found a loophole that allows us to discuss the film a little bit sooner than uh, five years from now, which would have been the alternative. So fortunately, we're going to have that opportunity to talk about really what is a tremendous film by my estimation. And I believe Sam enjoyed it as well. I almost wish we could have somebody on who doesn't like the, the La Dolce Vita just for the sake of a scintillating conversation. I just want to argue about this film, I guess, but I suppose I'll have to argue devil's advocate with myself when we get to that point. But regardless, La Dolce Vita, that episode is coming out later this week. Speaking of, we have to apologize profusely. We promised last week that our Q&A episode was going to be coming out sometime this past weekend. Unfortunately, we had to reschedule the Q&A. We actually began recording and we started answering questions. We were having a lot of goofy fun. Um, I was having a ton of fun. I don't know about you, Will. I don't know if you were horrified by some of what was going on in that Q&A episode. But yes, we got in about 45 minutes and uh, we had technical difficulties, and then we had some inconvenient uh, interruptions that forced us to reschedule. But I think, Will, uh, yeah, what, what were you thinking of the Q&A episode? Do you think it'll be a good chance for us to do some reshoots? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we're gonna going to start over or if we're going to keep what we had already, but... Um, I haven't decided yet. Yes, what would be the best way to go about it? Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't really get... We were mostly just goofing around, so it wasn't like we got too deep into questions that listeners asked so even if right. we did um start over like i don't think it would most people like maybe with the exception of, like one or two would would only lose their questions and we could always just answer them again it's not like uh, <laughs> they have to be lost or anything so uh yeah i think i think we will put out a good episode but it'll just take a little bit longer than we initially anticipated but hopefully for the better agreed yeah so keep your eye out for that uh q a episode coming out a little later than planned, but definitely still coming out in a form that will hopefully be enjoyable in some form or fashion. All right, that's enough off topics. We have some reviews to get to. Let's start with an American pickle. In old country of Shlupska, I am ditch digger. As far as jobs in Shlupska, it's pretty good. We are the Greenbounds, and we have American dreams. I find good job in Pico Factory. Sara, I make this vow. In 100 years, our family will prosper. And then one day, everything changed. Ah! 
It's been 100 years. The pickle brine preserved him perfectly. You're too old to do that. The world has changed. Everyone I know is gone. You were able to track down a great grandson. Green Bob. Green Bob. <laughs> this is nuts. Walk past the cafe, but you don't need when you live to. The opponents, where are they? They passed away. It was a car crash. He will tell me everything of their deaths, how their bodies died, their faces as the life left. We will bond over our pain. Mm -hmm. An American Pickle is now streaming on HBO Max. It's one of their first original movies. It's like really fully HBO Max, I think. The service hasn't been out that long. Yeah, I mean, initially this was a Sony release uh, yes. that was produced and intended to play in theaters. And then during the pandemic, they decided to sell it to HBO Max. And I guess there might be a little bit more to that. I haven't heard officially, so I won't speculate too much. But I guess they they... I guess weren't really keen on releases in theaters already. So that might've just been like a fortuitous kind of thing for the film, but I'm not too sure about that, but yeah, it's an HBO yeah. max film now. It is a strange film to market. Yeah. Like you said, they sold it to them and this is the first time I ever saw the new production company or newly branded production company, Warner max uh, in the opening logo. So That was an interesting uh, notice there. But yeah, so American Pickle stars Seth Rogen, and it was directed by Brandon Trost. This is his first directorial film, uh, solo. Yeah, I was gonna yeah, say, he's yeah. never he's never solo done. He's better known as a uh, cinematographer. Mm -hmm. um, he shot a lot of films uh, with some people you would recognize. He's he did one with uh, Seth Rogen. This is the end, um, mm -hmm. and then or also the interview. So a couple of those. Yeah, and uh, he did Neighbors. I think both sequel. Then this one and the sequel. He also, yeah, Neighbors 2. And then he also has shot some of Mariel Heller's films. So yeah. Can You Ever Forgive Me and Diary of a Teenage Girl. So yeah, it's an interesting uh, next step for him, I think, to direct a film like this. I know that I, I've liked the look of his films, like, for example, Popstar and The Disaster Artist, I think are shot really well. Um, but he's also shot some films that I think are kind of flat, um, that awkward moment. Uh, was something that he did and then also uh, extremely wicked shockingly evil and vile oh, i forgot he did that one yeah so you know his filmography is kind of all over the place i think uh, he's also done some truly terrible films like uh, uh that's my boy and uh, the ghostwriter sequel so uh, but eh, regardless, i don't know <laughs> i i don't i don't really hate the ghostwriter sequel i admire for what it is but it's right. not a good film it's not a good Fair film enough. but he did i think he did the crank sequel too if i'm not mistaken Regardless, he is the director, but Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg co-produced this along with James Weaver. Now, one thing I was very surprised about, and I didn't realize this until, I, I mean, I knew it going in, but I kind of forgot, actually, that the screenplay was not Seth Rogen. I had the feeling during this movie that Seth Rogen wrote this film or that it was like a personal no, story to him, and it's not. Simon Rich. Simon Rich, who, who I love. He, he wrote this screenplay based mm -hmm. on his short story from a few yeah. years ago Sellout. called Sellout. It's more of a yes. novella, but it's like 80 pages. So I think it's technically a novella, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's branded as a short story. Right. But yeah, he's he's known for Man Seeking Woman. Uh, he I is one of show. the youngest writers who's ever been on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, uh, I think he's he, um, for Pixar. Yeah, I was going to say, I think he helped with Inside Out. Yes, and he, he's well known in the film circuit as somebody who just... Uh, really good at evoking emotion in his films. And I'm a little surprised too, because uh, I think uh, one, of, one of the films that is going to come out from something he's written is a Jason Reitman film, I think. Um, I think the, his novel, Elliot Allagash. And so that's, for example, just one thing that I'm I'm very excited to see from him and also uh, Miracle Workers. Didn't he just sign on to do something with Edgar Wright as well? Not that I know of, uh, but that would be uh, pretty exciting to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe he's attached to that long promise, like Willy Wonka prequel that's been in the works of Warner Brothers for like, who knows how long. I believe he's attached to that as well. Our point is he is a well liked and sought after writer yeah. in Hollywood. I'm a big and, fan. Personally. Yeah. And, yeah. and and it's funny because I I kind of forgot that this was his story while I was watching the movie. Really? I, I was so convinced that, yeah, there was something about the mm -hmm. way that the film centers Seth Rogen that I was thinking that maybe this was something that was kind of personal to Seth Rogen, his Jewish heritage. And so getting into the plot of this film, uh, Seth Rogen plays his, uh, 
a man in 1919 who gets preserved in pickle brine and then meets his great grandson played also by seth rogan and the two of them have a tension fish out of water story about the american dream um, Seth Rogen's great grandfather Herschel is his name, and Herschel has very traditional, old fashioned ideas. They conflict with his grandson Ben, who, great grandson, who is a freelance app developer, and they, they have a sort of disagreement over how they cherish their families, how to make it in America. Herschel decides that he is going to start a pickle empire at one point. There's a lot of silly things that happen in this movie uh, to the point where I was momentarily charmed by it in spurts, but I found myself a little unimpressed by this film in general. I don't think the emotional through lines, which are between these two characters, ever really hit me. And I think the big weakness of this film, in my personal opinion, is how few characters there seem to be or characters with agency or characters who can mix things up. This film has a lot of side characters. There are some who kind of come and go. And as soon as you start to get to know one who is interesting, who might perk your ears up, they disappear from the film. And so I found that to be a little bit of a letdown. I, I'm not as into an American pickle. I think it's a bit forgettable. I'm already sort of moving on from the film in general, but it's not bad. And I think a lot of people who are curious about it will find it interesting enough. But what, what do you think, Will Ash? And I think because you're in the film, you're probably predisposed uh, to liking it a lot more than I did. Well, to be fair, like I, you're, you're, you suggest this, but um, yeah, I, I filmed a couple scenes as an extra in this film. Um, but I, as far as I can tell, I'm not in the final cut. So uh i mean just, which i just, i told you and then a, a yeah. bunch of people got your hopes up and were like well yeah, yeah i saw you will come on yeah i mean i might be i don't know i'm just saying i didn't see myself i mean i might be in the movie for all i know and i just missed i it. rewatched it several times really? like all the yeah. scenes that you describe that you were an extra yeah. in and i'm like freeze framed yeah. and all i mean stuff, and i'm telling you i did not see yeah. it i mean i'm pretty sure the big scene that we shot and this will kind of get into something i was talking about later but um yeah i think they they cut a lot of the film because there was like a big montage scene that we filmed with Seth Rogen, like selling the pickles and doing the stuff. And I don't believe any of that was actually in the final cut. So I think that was like the majority of my scene. So I'm probably on the cutting room floor somewhere along with uh, what's her name? Maya Eskrin, who was also supposed to be really? in this film. And she was cut out entirely <laughs> uh, for for reasons I'm not quite sure. I believe I mean, because I have read the short story novella and there's like a big uh, character that's not in this, which was uh, Ben's girlfriend. Um, so, and I'm assuming she played that part because she just is completely absent from the film. Uh, and they don't even like mention or address that he had a girlfriend. So right. I'm guessing that was cut out, but yeah. Um, I'll say real quick. I think that could have really saved this film. I love Maya Eskrin and that to, before you get into it, I think that is the thing that's missing is somebody in Ben's life. And I think they're trying to get across that he is alone. He doesn't have anybody. And now he has his great grandfather come into the picture. And even though I think that works on paper, there was something about it that just rang a little false to me. And I, I, I was a bit frustrated with Ben as a character in general, but go ahead. Your thoughts on the film. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've only been involved with like a day's worth of production, so I don't really know what happened uh, as far as the movie being made. But um, yeah, I, I think there was a lot here that just like got reworked or changed throughout the process to the point where it just seemed like they were watching the footage they had and they're like, OK, what's working here? And they noticed it was mostly the like family dynamic between Ben and uh, Herschel. So I think they just, that's I think the reason why you felt like the world was kind of absent is because it seemed like they cut everything that was like a side plot like that for the most part out of it, which I think a normal film would bug me and it does make it kind of messy. But I don't know. I just I actually personally found the family dynamic between Herschel and Ben to be really charming and uh, surprisingly kind of insightful about generational divides and then heritage and like these type of topics, that, especially with Jewish identity, don't really get explored in studio movies of this vein. And I felt like it was very sweet and emotionally resonant in a way that I find a lot of Simon Rich's work to be. And so I don't know. I, I mean, maybe I'm biased cause I really like all the people involved with this and it was filmed in Pittsburgh. Uh, and you can tell cause this is like the most Pittsburghy version of New York city ever. But yeah, I really enjoyed this a lot. I do enjoy the sort of inside joke 
that suggests essentially that Pittsburgh is a lot like Brooklyn or it looks like Brooklyn. Uh, well, and that's a joke. Yeah. yeah. There's a joke that's been brought up, of course, in a few other yeah. films that have been. Yeah. I think where this movie loses me and I, I'm not giving anything away here really, but there is a certain altercation that happens in a cemetery. And I think from that point forward, the film essentially, it, it just loses me a bit. I think the writing for Ben's character up until that point, he comes off a certain way. He's very affable. He wants to get along with his great grandfather. He wants to help him out. And it's infectious. I, I found all of that very uh, wonderful to watch, including when we meet Herschel in his own time and the relationship between him and his wife, yeah. Sarah. Best scenes of the really movie. really good laughs. It's, it's sure. really, that's where I think that sweet and resonant affection that you're speaking of, that's where I personally found it as well but i don't see it in the rest of the film i think ben becomes strangely antagonistic and i think sure. the things that they cut out help spell out that character change that's my assumption at this point yeah, i would agree i think that something else must have happened to create a rift that spurs on the second act of the film that just does not show up in the final product and i i, I do appreciate the intention of tightening this film, focusing it. I was thrilled to see that it was just, what, 89 minutes, very lean, mm -hmm. very quick watch. But I think it happens at the expense of the film resonating emotionally for me personally. And my other main criticism with this movie is that it, it does shift its tone a little bit too often. I'm okay if tones shift here and there. I think it can be done. It can be done well. But this movie does sort of change on a hat. And I, I found myself thinking maybe it's a screenplay that doesn't know what aspect of the novel it wants to be. There are several movies that it is like riffing from, of course. Uh, you have Coming to America vibes here. You have uh, some Borat <laughs> going on in some places. There is a lot of attention paid to the way that Herschel is a uh, person who makes people uh, upset because of his bigoted quotes, but then it also makes him weirdly popular. And so at yeah, one point, kind of even though... Yes, yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of Trump commentary here that is hard to escape, and I don't think you needed to go there. I think it was being nuanced about that sort of thing, but then yeah. it goes full into that idea, and it was just something that I I thought was very clumsy and not not something I personally found effective. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with any of that, and I think some cases I do agree. Like, I do think the middle section that's like basically Herschel becoming Trump for like five or ten minutes. It's probably the weakest part of the film, uh, but it did have the biggest laugh of the movie. So I, I'm not mad that it's in the film. <laughs> yes, there is. There is a very, a very wonderful laugh <laughs> or, or there's a good payoff to all of that. I'll give it that. Yeah, no, I, I thought that joke was fantastic. But um, yeah, I don't know. I guess where I ultimately disagree or separate from you is that I guess I just found it more emotionally affecting than you did. And I guess I was just ultimately more charmed by it. Maybe it's just because it's like a very local film and it, it involves people that I like a lot. but. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think what really made it work for me was Seth Rogen's performance. I do agree that Ben's character, probably more from the way he was edited down, does feel kind of impartial. And then like his character arc can feel a little erratic at points. But I thought uh, especially Rogen as uh, Herschel was like surprisingly very, very like humane and soulful in a way that I was anticipating. Uh, like because it's the type of form performance where it's so easy to make this like a caricature to like just make it like a big accent and not much else but I think for the most part and maybe some people disagree with this but I felt like he was able to make it more fleshed out and make it have a kind of uh, kind of uh, emotional tightness or something that made it feel a little bit more authentic and affecting than what might have been on the page I don't know but I do think that, yeah, I mean, I it's a messy film. I'm not going to argue otherwise, but a lot of my favorite comedies are super messy, like Anchorman and Caddyshack. So <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. I, it made me laugh and I and, and it made my heart feel good. And it was exactly what I wanted it to be. So I'm not complaining at all. I, I will agree with you that it is a messy film, and but not necessarily in a bad way. I, again, I don't think this is a bad movie. And I, it also made me laugh. There are some good laughs here. I guess where it comes down to me is that I think it, despite the strong writing for Herschel to what you're talking about, because I also found him to be an, a, a soulful character. He's written in a very interesting way, and I think that is a welcomed holdover 
from the uh, adap- the uh, I shouldn't say adaptation, but from the the short story, the novella, yeah, yeah, right. Overall, I just found its message, its core point about connection to family, to be a little bit watered down and a little bit expected. There was nothing about it that I found sure. particularly surprising, and yeah, by the end of it. I was sort of like, the movie is over. Uh, there was nothing that felt imparted to me. So I, I, I guess I just find myself already forgetting about the film, like I said before, and I don't have too much else to say about it. It's not a film that I think I would ever want to revisit, to be totally mm. honest. But I do respect sure. that it does have that local flavor. It does have some certain things about it that speak to you personally, and I can definitely appreciate that. Sure. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, it does follow some fairly conventional story beats, especially for this fish out of water comedy genre. But I don't know. I think there's just enough idiosyncratic elements to this that really made it work. And I think in addition to the writing, what I really did like was that because Brandon Truss is a cinematographer, the visual style of this movie was a lot more inventive than what we usually get from these studio comedies, Uh, especially like you said in the opening, which I I felt was way more evocative and unique as visual display than like some of the movies we'll get even during like award season. Uh, I, I don't know. I really appreciate what they both brought as a writer and director into this. And ultimately, like I said, I think Seth Rogen is what makes it work. I think I I can see why tightening the movie up to like its bare essentials does prevent it from really living up to its initial promise or potential. But I think that the family elements were affecting and I do think they were charming in a way that I felt it worked. Yeah. I mean, I can see the problems. I can see the flaws as a critic. I can point in the same way and be like, yeah, this doesn't work. This is off. But I don't know. Emotionally, this did a lot for me and uh, I needed it. So I'm happy I got it. I'm going to give this one a C plus. I think that a lot of what works in here is particularly competent. Yes, the humor, the writing, the visual style, like you said, I did find it uh, a bit of a cut above. And I think that's that's, of course, a lot of what Brandon Trost can bring to a film as a director and a cinematographer in general. But yeah, and, and and the things that work about this too that we didn't touch on is I think there is a message here connect that connects the the family dynamic and understanding where you come from with uh, religion as well, confronting your demons with religion and how life in our country is so different than it was a hundred years ago and the reasons people rely on religion and comfort and why it exists. There was something kind of sweet and affecting about that. It, it sort of gets dropped. It's not something that I think is extremely powerful. And again, it's not that surprising, but I do think that it is welcome. It's something that is a, an interesting message that is a little bit more provocative than the rest of the film in some places. I think one thing I didn't mention that doesn't work for me is the way the plot phrase a bit. It kind of goes off in these tangents and directions that I, I just did not find myself as interested in. I think once you get to the point where Herschel and Ben start to compete with each other and and thing happens and then another thing happens and it's a lot of plot, but I didn't particularly enjoy the story when it got to that point of the film. So yeah, just a C plus from me. Um, I could see it being a B minus someday if I rewatch it. But yeah, as it stands now, I just think it's it's okay. And uh, I think some people will get more out of it than I certainly did. Uh, yeah, I mean, so quality wise, I think this is probably closer to the B minus territory. Uh, spiritually, this is like an A movie for me. So I'll split the difference and give it a high B. I don't know. I, I, I recognize everything you're saying. Uh, I, I acknowledge that I don't think you're inaccurate or I don't think anything you said is particularly wrong. I, I do think those flaws are apparent. And I think that prevents the film from being as good as it could have been or maybe should have been. But no, I mean, I, I, I just ultimately think it works better than you're suggesting, or at least it just it hit me in, in an affecting way. So uh, I don't know. I really like uh, Simon Rich's way of blending these kind of outlandish, kind of directly and explicitly metaphorical concepts with a very kind of heartfelt approach in a way that, you know, clearly comes from a personal place. Uh, that's very much what I like in a very high concept comedy like this. And ultimately, uh, it worked for me. So, uh, yeah, I'll give it a B. All right. And I, you know what? We didn't even talk about the nature of the dual performance here. Uh, kind of funny that we didn't even touch on that. But I guess I sort of speaks to the film's magic trick. I think Seth Rogen does a good job of preventing us from thinking too deeply about his yep. dual performance. And he's working really hard here. And I think that it it certainly works the extent it needs to. 
Mm-hmm. The this film, An American Pickle, is now streaming on HBO Max. If you live overseas outside of the US, you have the opportunity to possibly see it theatrically. There are some countries that are showing it in oh, theaters. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but for the rest of us, uh, it is already on HBO Max. You can watch it that way. I don't think this necessarily needs to be seen on the big screen, but that would certainly I would be like to if see we it. had if yeah. we had the option, I would love that. So Yeah. <laughs> that's an American pickle. A a B from Will and a C plus from me. Can I just say how weird it is that I, this doesn't have anything to do with the movie itself. It's just that there's a scene where like Seth Rogen's character comes out into the world for like the first time in modern day. And it's like exactly where my workplace is. <laughs> and it's oh, like wow. the first place I've seen that workplace in like six months because of the <laughs> pandemic. So it's like, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I, I don't know how to tell you how surreal it is for this fish out of water comedy to like make me see my line of work for like the first time in half a year. <laughs> but I don't know. That, that's that's 2020 for you, I guess. Well, there you go. Yes. Uh, I'm glad you had to have that revisiting yeah. of your workplace. I, I, guess, I hope yeah, it was it's, therapeutic. It's very strange. Uh, it was something. <laughs> Let's move on to our next film, The Tax Collector. The Tax Collector is oh, the favorite. latest film from David Ayer, my favorite director. Yeah, you, Unfortunately, you <laughs> Unfortunately, this won't be his last film because he still has that Dirty Dozen remake that's still in development. Wait, but, what? I didn't know about that. Oh, yeah. There's a new Dirty Dozen that David Ayer uh, is attached to. I, I don't know if he's director, producer, or what. He's the writer, director, producer of this film, though. And something tells me that even this Dirty Dozen remake might be in jeopardy because, once again, David Ayer has provided quite a massive misfire. Um, this is the guy who directed and produced Bright, the Netflix movie from 2017 starring Will Smith and Joel Edgerton. Before that, he made Suicide Squad in 2016. Both of those are pretty weak films. Uh, Suicide Squad, at this point, Suicide Squad is being completely revamped by a different director, and they're trying to pretend it didn't even exist, it, which is strange because both of these movies were immensely popular right when they came out. Suicide Squad was actually a solid box office success. I think it made almost $800 million. And Bright has, is still touted by Netflix to be one of their most watched movies. I think at that time, it was like the most watched movie or one of them next to like maybe the Adam Sandler movies. But... That's the thing with Ayer's films. They tend to age about as well as, I don't know, summer plans in 2020, right? So I think his some of his earlier films have aged, or not aged a little bit better, but are held in more esteem, something like maybe End of Watch and Fury. But yeah, yeah with- Training Day for sure. Training Day, yeah, which was a while back. Like he's done a lot of screenplays. Eventually, I think a lot of people who say they like these films at the time, like when they first come out, kind of walk back their praise a little bit or in some cases forget they even watched it which has happened to me at least uh, but anyway his new film tax collector stars bobby soto and if you watch the trailer you might actually get the impression it co-stars shia labeouf that labeouf is the big star of this movie uh, he actually appeared before in airs 2014 film that i just mentioned fury and that was one of the reasons i was tentatively excited about Tax Collector, the prospect of seeing a reuniting of Air and LaBeouf was interesting. And also the fact that he's going back to his roots of like LA street gangs. That didn't excite me necessarily though, because he tends to do it in very stereotypical fashion, which we'll get into. But aside from that, the sad thing is LaBeouf is completely underutilized here. And the trailer is absolutely misleading. He's barely in it. Uh, He exists merely as a bullet point of grievances I have for this film, particularly the decision to cast him, a white actor, into a Mexican role, which was completely unnecessary and a bizarre choice. And I I didn't recognize too many other actors, to be clear, in this film besides George Lopez, who gets kind of a thankless role, and Jimmy Smits. And I had the thought by the end of this movie that maybe what would have worked better here is a prequel. Starring those two characters, I think it would have made for something a little bit more interesting. It's hard to describe though, unless you've seen the film, but instead, here's the movie we have. And it's a story yet again from air that takes place in LA and it's about street gangs. And uh, this one is about a Latino man named David played again, once again by Soto. He works with LaBeouf as a tax collector in quotes, as in they go around collecting a cut from the local street gangs in LA and they give the money to their crime lord, wizard. He's played by Smits. Things go south at one point, though, when they have a rival gang from Mexico show up to town and they start disrupting the business. And 
that's about the best I can describe this plot because to call it clumsily written would be almost misleading. Like it might actually give the wrong impression that this script contains any of the structure or the polish or the impact you'd expect considering the serious subject matter at play. And on the one hand, I'm tempted to blame the pandemic for maybe upending the post-production of this movie. Uh, I think in many ways, you get the sense that they rushed this thing to the finish line. And maybe we'd be talking about a C or a C plus movie if quarantine had never happened, especially because this is from RLJE Films. And this isn't one of the major studios with like the resources you would really need to coordinate remote production work. Apparently, they made this movie two years ago, so it's hard to tell what happened in the process. Whatever the case, the final product here is a complete mess in both concept and execution, particularly in the second half of the movie when the entire thing completely flies off the rails and somersaults into music video logic and not a good music video. And if, it, if it, just holding on to that metaphor, it's like if the song and the music video is just a mashup of every boring, played out LA gang movie trope you can think of, and they're all playing and making tons of excruciating noise at the exact same time. The concept of the movie leans heavily into Ayer's original bag of tricks that we've seen from him before. Racial stereotypes, empty, meaningless violence, half-hearted gender dynamics that lionize a version of hyper-masculinity we tend to see more in Michael Bay films. And even then, it's something that just feels so 2000s. It doesn't feel fresh or unique. And specifically, it's such a misfire when it comes to how this film expects the audience to sympathize with the main protagonist. He's a drug dealer who rips off other drug dealers. But I suppose we're supposed to like him because he's a little bit more polite than the other guy, played by LaBeouf, and he has a family. Okay, that's it. That, that's the only the only ammo this movie gives you to say, I'm rooting for this guy, and just does not happen, doesn't work. If you're fine with everything I just said, and you know what, you just want to be entertained, you don't really care about all this, the struggle with this movie continues with the execution, because most of the performances just aren't there. The music doesn't sync with the movie most of the time. And as I said before, the writing verges on a cartoon. It's cartoonish to the point where you can easily tell that they chose not to correct mistakes they made in the editing, either because they had no time or they were just they were just hoping to push this thing out the door. I was like, oh, we made a mistake there. Just whatever. Just 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 do it. It doesn't matter. That that's really the care or like the level of care that comes across. And I feel bad if that's not the case. If they really did put a lot of effort and then something went wrong that was outside of their control in the post-production, I do apologize if that's the case, but that's certainly not how it comes across. I think, honestly, this is the worst movie of the year that is not on Netflix. After watching this dreck, I craved rewatching any of the John Wick films just to cleanse my palate and help me forget any of this happened. I give it a D minus. And the reason it's not an F is because I do see LaBeouf in here committing, giving it his all, working out as much as he can with the limited screen time he gets. I, I can't believe, Will, that he got a chest tattoo for this yeah. movie. Mm -hmm. It it was absolutely such a such a shame that this movie exists. I, I can't believe how wrong it went. And right now it's only available via drive-ins and VOD. I think it may be only a handful of drive-ins as far as I know. Uh, critics besides me are not enjoying this as well. I think that's a pretty low Rotten Tomato score last I checked. I don't know what's going to happen with David Ayer's career at this point, but I hope people stay away from this movie. But I have a feeling, Will, because I've said all of that, you are all, you're maybe more inspired than ever to go check this one out for yourself. Yeah, it sounds like a great time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've seen all of David Ayer's directorial efforts, as far as I can recall. And the only one I remember saying, oh, that was a good film, was Fury. And now, like you said, I, I haven't seen it Same. since it came out, so... Maybe it, it, it hasn't aged particularly well. I can't say it's been a few years, but I mean, like End of Watch is OK. Like it, it, it definitely wasn't I don't think as good as some people were hyping it up to be. I probably like it slightly better than you did. I thought it was decent, like a little bit better than OK, just slightly. Yeah, I mean, that's basically where I'm at. I just like I, I, I think the main thing I remember liking were the performances from Michael Pena and uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. But like other than that, I don't really remember being particularly taken by the rest of it. But um, yeah, I mean, I think as a director, he definitely leaves something 
to be desired. Um, particularly with his last two films, uh, I remember Bright being exceptionally boring given the high concept, and then Suicide Squad was just a big mess. And it sounds like this is no exception. It really isn't. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you when it comes to Fury. Um, I did not see Sabotage. That's the the one from him. Oh, that one was seen. pretty bad. But that's that, that that almost verges into fun bad territory hmm. because Arnold because uh, of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. But not really. I also have this movie. I also it haven't like. seen Harsh Times. The the only the first That's film I great. saw from him is one of his first films, Street Kings, in two thousand eight. I, I saw it in the theater. Um, that's yeah. one of the the few films he's directed that he did not write or at least produce. And Street Kings, yeah, that that one I, I found myself mainly bored by it, not really interested. And in I think that was I just found it very Reeves forgettable. And Chris Evans, yeah, yeah very forgettable. Um, that again, that's going into his like street crime roots. As far as his screenplays go, yeah, he did the screenplay for Fast and Furious, Training Day, like you mentioned, Dark mm-hmm. Blue, SWAT, and you know none of those films. I think, with the exception of maybe Fast and the Furious, were in Training, uh, in Training Day. Day, yeah, yeah, uh, were all that impressive. I think he did another film from like 2000. I'm forgetting. I, I, I never saw it, but there was there was some other film that he worked on first before mm-hmm. Training Day. Regardless, uh, I I just don't I just don't see this movie uh, helping him out um, when it comes to securing new projects. But I think because he has that flash in the pan success with some of his movies, particularly Brighton Suicide Squad, I just think he keeps getting hired to make more movies. He's kind of like failing upward, but in some ways you could say he's not failing. That's because Hollywood. They're they're yeah they're they're still making money. They're still getting eyeballs i just wish more talented directors would get the budget and the second chances third fourth fifth chances that this director gets i have nothing against david air personally and i understand a lot of people who really do appreciate his style and they have they don't have the same issues with him that i do um i'm just speaking on a professional filmmaking level i'm sure, sure. he is a very decent person in real life as far as i understand so that said just not a fan of Maybe. his movies and we'll see what happens with Dirty Dozen if that ends up coming to pass. I think he is supposed to not just direct, but also write and produce that as well. Yeah. And uh, Bright 2, I think he's involved with from a writing and directing standpoint, but I don't know what's going on there. I think that's, yeah, if, if that is the case, I don't think it's official quite yet. Uh, there's only one other project I'm aware of that he's doing, which is a uh, TV thing. I think it's like a TV movie that he directed called uh, Deputy. Have you heard of Deputy? Nope. Yeah, it's. Sounds like I a don't... pilot that didn't get picked up. <laughs> well, I think it's I think it's more of like a TV series. I can't remember if it's a series or a movie on TV, but th- this is the Will Beale thing that he, um, Will Beale created. Are you looking, this, is this on? Is this on IMDb? Are it could be. I I didn't see it on there, but uh, okay, okay, I wasn't sure because I know like when they oh, say like TV it movie that okay, it came it... out, but it had already got canceled. I just okay, yeah, never mind. Uh, I think he directed some of it and might have executive produced, and it's coming hmm. back to me. I think that uh, he directed like the first couple episodes, and it came out earlier this year, and it had decent ratings, but I think they canceled it. Well, all right, so much for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it that, is it weird Fox. though. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, the main thing I heard about this uh, feels like a bad like FX pilot from like 2005. That seems to be the main complaint I've been hearing uh, outside of everything you said. Um, That's not but. Enough. Yeah, but I do think it's interesting, though, if, if this was filmed two years ago and American Pickle was filmed two years ago, that we're kind of getting these two films now this week. Uh, I don't know. I guess, like you said before, this is just that point in the pandemic. But well, here we are. Yeah, I kind of mentioned to you off the air that I, I am kind of wondering if with movies like these, I'm starting to wonder if the effects on production from the pandemic are starting to become more apparent so far you know all of this started to go down in march right where we had to quarantine and yep. i think the immediate results was they already had films and tv shows that were finished that they could just put out or had so little post-production work that they could be done remotely but yeah like i was saying before i think some studios don't have the resources for resources for that and i think there were films that were in the middle of post-production that we are going to start seeing potentially the consequences of the shutdown in America and overseas markets like as well. The, like when the writer's strike happened, like that, like 2009, yeah. 2010 period. I, I could see that. Exactly. It, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it's something that has ripple effects. And I think this is the very beginning of what will be a long ripple effect that we're going to be experiencing. It's kind of the double-edged sword of releasing things right now because in order to like fill this gap that people want entertainment. But then I think we're going to get to a point where there's not going to be a lot coming out because they sort of waited and the only thing that might be coming out are theatrical releases and i think the strategy will be fewer streaming releases from some of these studios like 
Warner Brothers and all of that mm-hmm. and Disney Plus so that people will go to the movie theater because the only new things coming out are going to be what Mulan or whatever. So uh, regardless, yeah. that's the tax Maybe. collector and, and a light prediction I have for the future of the movie industry as I see it. And it, just personally, I don't think it looks very bright mm. too. Right too. Anyway, let's talk about our next film. Sure. Uh, last one of the week. Waiting for the Barbarians. Now, I really wanted to see this. We both had the screener, and I'm really glad that you had a chance yeah, you to, to squeeze this one in. Yeah, I, I got you the screener, and uh, I was going to watch it as well. This is the film that um, premiered last year at the Venice Film Festival. Samuel Goldman Films finally released it. This is directed by Ciro Guerra. It stars Mark Rylance, Johnny Depp, Robert Pattinson, uh, Ghana Bayash Khan, and Greta Scacchi. And I have been looking forward to it quite a bit. I think they filmed this partly in Italy and also in the United States. I don't know too much about the plot, though, so I want to hear it from you, Will. What is this movie about? I know it's based on a novel, uh, but that's about as much as I know about what this one is about. Um, And I know it has some people in the cast and production who have been, uh, quote, canceled. I don't know about that. So uh, I guess we'll get into it. But yes, so take it away, Will. Uh, Yeah, like you said, this is... um based on a novel of the same name by J.M. Uh, Cotes, I believe. Uh, yeah, yeah it's J.M. And Coetzee. And he did the screenplay Coetzee. for this, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the big thing was that this is Chero Guerra. Uh, is that how you pronounce his name? The director? I, I, I could be wrong. I think it's Ciro Guerra. But Ciro Guerra? That is, we'll call him great. CG if we want to avoid offense. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, he's really well known for like in the art house scene. He made like Embrace the Serpent. And then he made, uh, oh, what's that movie? The one with uh, the girl from Terminator Dark Fate. Um, Are you talking about uh, Mackenzie Birds Davis? of Passage. Birds no, of no, Passage? No, no, no. no, Bird of Passage. It was... Um, well, no, I'm Gator. just... Yeah. Oh, so it's not Mackenzie Davis. It's... Uh, oh, the, the lead lady. Act? Yeah, it was the other actress. Um, I feel bad. I don't remember her name off the top of my head. Um, you mean... It, are, are you are you talking about... Um, Natalia Rice? Reyes. I for a second I thought you might be talking about Sarah Connor. I was like, wait a minute, what? No. <laughs> no. Um No, no. She was like I mean, like Natalia was like technically like the main character, but like she yeah. wasn't. Um anyway. Yeah, so this is his English language debut. If you're wondering to yourself, hey, why is this movie from a prominent uh foreign language director made with uh Robert Pattinson, Mark Rylance, and Robert Pat uh, did I say Robert Pattinson twice? <laughs> Maybe uh, but I Johnny think you Depp. should. <laughs> yeah. Rob Pattinson, Johnny Depp, and Mark Rylance. Why is this movie not getting a bigger release or a bigger splash? Well, well, before you say that, before you say that, I do want to say some people will probably know him too because he had the Netflix miniseries, right? Um, he was an executive producer, and I think he directed some of Green Frontier. Um, I think that's okay. probably the most American recognized thing that he might have. But yes, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I mostly know him from the uh, the two films I mentioned, which I've been meaning to see and I haven't. But uh, yeah, sure. I mean, also I- also his short films. Oh yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, if you're wondering yourself, hey, these are three very big stars. Uh, Jai Depp, maybe less so nowadays, but, you know, it's three big stars. And it's like, why have I not heard about this movie? And it's like, well, the disclaimer is that the director has been uh, accused by several women of sexual misconduct or sexual harassment. And I think that's kind of uh, clouded the film in some respects. And I think uh, Samuel Goldwyn has been kind of just like slowly just pushing us to VOD to try to avoid any uh big splashes i think they were kind of hoping like you know died up you know he's he's not the, the the name he once was but you know the mark rylance and robert pattinson can maybe steer the ship but uh i think that's the big reason it's not being yeah and so we can be a little specific so people are aware the this isn't like a minor accusation it's not like one person so yeah specifically no, I mean, it's multiple women yeah yes so it's eight women over the period of six years Right. Apparently, they, it's sexual harassment and yeah. also sexual assault. And oh, really? I didn't know that. Yes. He's denied the accusations, but it's looking like uh, the evidence is against him um, based on the people who did this investigation. Yeah. And so, the, yeah, it's it's not looking good. And then also, he was already kind of like um, on the outs with people because he divorced. He and his wife divorced while they were co-directing Birds of Passage together, if I'm calling correctly. So, Ooh, geez. Yeah, so there's clearly some issues going on with, uh, like, the last couple of years, he's been having um, some issues. And I think uh, 
if if any of this is true, which it appears to ring true for me, yeah. I think that like there's Probably. no way I would have paid for this movie. Uh, the fact yeah. the only reason I would watch it is because we had screeners for it. So just putting right. it that out there, honestly. Yeah, I mean that's what I was gonna say. I mean that's the reason I was kind of building up is that like if. I mean, it's pretty understandable why people are probably not going to be seeking this one out, given the people involved with it. And I think that's totally understandable. Um, but as a film, uh, I will say it, it's it's very dry. <laughs> uh, it's a desert drama. It's very old fashioned. It's approach. Uh, and I think that might make it a little bit frustrating for some people as far as it's kind of patient approach. But as a film, it's generally pretty good. <laughs> Uh, I, I think mainly it's because Mark Rylance does give a very earnest and, and uh, natural performance. Uh, yeah, he gives a very like natural and earnest performance as this uh, magistrate who manages this uh, kind of unnamed part of the Empire. And then as Johnny Depp's character, this uh, colonel comes in and starts to try to get uh, some use some torture techniques to get information out of what is considered the barbarians. Uh, Mark Rylance is more of a humanitarian. He believes in like peace and human rights and all this stuff. And that ultimately puts him at odds with the other parts of the empire, including uh, Robert Pattinson, who is not really introduced until about 80 minutes into the film. So <laughs> just be aware of that if you're going to watch it. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a film very slow, very methodical as far as its approach. And I don't think it's necessarily saying anything in that time that hasn't really been approached before in other ways. And I imagine that the book is probably a little bit more thoughtful in its approach because Mark Ryland's character is such a like internalized character that feels like a lot of stuff is kind of happening inward. And maybe the book is a little bit better at communicating that, that conflict and that struggles in a way that the film, while I admire the approach doesn't fully communicate in a way that I think really drives home some of the uh, emotional punch of this, but as a film, I mean, it's very well made. Like, it definitely, you can tell that uh, for all of his, uh, you know, definitely personal problems, he is an accomplished filmmaker. And I, I think he avoids a lot of the big, like, English language debut problems that tend to sometimes happen when there's, like, that kind of awkward, like, language divide or, like, things like that that sometimes trip some foreign language directors up. I think he mostly relies on kind of the nuance and the quiet moments to really captivate this film. And uh, I think that was for the better. But it's not something that I think is like a must see. I think it's ultimately just pretty good for what it is, but not like a like tour the force or like a truly affecting and deeply resonant film. I just think it's very well made for what it is. But I think its audience might be somewhat limited and beyond the uh, personal troubles by the fact that it's a fairly contemplative and uh, like I said, methodical film. So I'll give it a B minus. Like I said, nothing, nothing terribly great, but it is well made. And I definitely admired Mark Rylance's performance in this. And, you know, I mean, Johnny Depp, I mean, I, I don't have too many nice things to say about him as a person right now, but uh, he does give a good and effectively pretty creepy performance in this as well. So that's waiting for the barbarians. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Yeah, just under two hours. This is a bit of a slow burn, um, but it, I've, I've also heard that it's a bit gorgeous in some of the cinematography and that there are some yeah, messages here. Yeah about colonialism that are interesting, um, good conversation starters, things like that. But yeah, I, my favorite thing about this movie though, again, I don't know too much about it, but it, it does have the type of poster that I love. I was just looking at the poster and it's one of those posters where the uh, the are names aren't, Oh, okay. Well, it's the kind of poster where like the names of the actors uh, don't coincide with their placement oh, on the yeah. poster. I love mm -hmm. it. That's my favorite thing. So yeah, um, that, that's the nice that... thing I'll say. Mm hmm. I think that happened with the Bill and Ted poster too recently. Like it says like, hopefully on uh, purpose. Yeah, maybe. Um, but I, yeah, I was gonna say, I thought you were talking about like those posters where it's like the very artsy, like people are looming over something and they're all looking at different directions. Like well, a yeah, that's rock too. album. <laughs> 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 yeah. They're about to drop the heaviest mixtape this side yeah. of wine country. <laughs> right. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, uh, I, it's it's definitely one that like I can certainly understand people are probably not going to seek out and for understandable reason, but you know it's it's pretty well made for what it is. Bit of a bummer of an episode, uh, just a handful of B's, C's, and D's. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, <laughs> like I said, spiritually, American Pickle is an A sure. film for me. Sure, but critically, that's one I have you, to acknowledge. you seem yeah, you actually really recommend that one. So yeah, it, it comes from the heart. Let's finish out the show with what we might be talking about next week. The big film coming out. 
is going to be on Netflix this time. Uh, there was a Netflix film that came out this week that we didn't touch on called Work It. Uh, yeah, just kind of looking at the logline for that, I wasn't as interested. So I did not prioritize watching it. But this week, there is a, a bigger budget film hitting Netflix called Project Power. This is kind of like a sci-fi superhero action movie, uh, kind of like the old guard, I guess. They're, they're getting into that. Um, this yeah. one is directed by Ariel Shulman, Henry Joost. It stars Jamie Foxx, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Interesting cast. I think Machine Gun Kelly is also in this. And it's kind of like a thing sure. where like, you take a pill and it gives you superpowers, something to that effect. And then oh, limitless. action ensues. Yes, it's kind of like Limitless, uh, the, the movie where they become li- uh, where he becomes Limitless. Yeah. So that'll be on Netflix. We'll probably be talking about that. Uh, there's also Magic Camp. Which is uh, yeah. hitting Disney Plus, which you and I were talking about this off the air. Did not see this one even coming. I hadn't heard much about it. But yeah, this is the yeah. one. That I think you said from the, the Crazy Ex-Girlfriend people kind of worked on this. And then the script. Yeah, uh, a lot of people were working. I think some people from How I Met Your Mother worked on this. Mark Waters directed it from Mean Girls and a few other films. Um, yeah, it seemed like a film that initially they were very hyped about. But then because Jeffrey Tambor is involved pretty prominently yeah. in it. Disney uh, buried it and now they're kind of at a, a, a loss for content right now. They're just kind of like taking the buckets of water and throwing it over the edge so that the <laughs> ship doesn't sink. And it's just yeah. it's like, well, we got this one. It's finished. Just put it out there. <laughs> Poor Gillian Jacobs. Another yeah, Gillian Jacobs her. movie that's being buried. And then mm. also Adam Devine is in it. But uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of him. like, OK, whatever um, when it comes to his work. But yeah. Uh, I, I guess we'll. I, I kind of told you off the air too. I think Magic Camp. It sounds like the name of like a Disney Channel original movie. So, it does. Uh, yes. I'm very curious uh, what, what, what's going on there. But uh, yeah, I'm not very excited. Uh, we also have Boy State, which is going to be streaming on Apple TV. This is the A24 documentary. It's one of my favorite movies of the year. Saw it in January. Highly, highly recommend. I hope a lot of you see it. It's a really great documentary about students in Texas who spend a week. Uh, creating their own government and it's sort of about it's like a microcosm of the way uh left and right politics sort of coincide it's like about the way the next generation generation z views politics and the lessons that they're learning from us that's really what this documentary is getting at and it's powerful it's really emotional and it, it it's a bit of a miracle of a documentary considering what they were able to get on camera so highly highly recommend boy state of course i have to give the usual disclaimer that I do work for Apple streaming on Apple TV has nothing to do. I I really was praising this movie before Apple and a 24 announced the whole thing with it. As far as I know, I could be wrong about that. Did you convince Apple to buy it? (laughs) I did not. I had nothing to do with any of that stuff. So I promise. All right. Um, I would have, if I had any other power, (laughs) Uh, but I'd have to be upfront about that, I guess. Uh, There's also another Sundance film called Spree, which is hitting video on demand. This is the one with, uh, what's his name? Joe Keery from Stranger Things. He plays Steve. Steve. Yeah. This is like the rideshare killer movie. And I heard it's kind of fun, but I didn't hear it's very good. So we'll see Uh, that it looks kind of like an interesting drive in movie. If you can catch it that way. Oh man. A fun bad boy movie. All right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And then uh, Sputnik, which you and I did not know about before we started doing the planning for this episode but yeah Sputnik is like an alien horror movie and it mainly features like Russian actors Russian director mm-hmm. it's about like a Russian capsule that might have like alien life in it and it's got like horror vibes to it I haven't seen the trailer but I just kind of like was reading the synopsis and it seems interesting enough seems like something if I have the opportunity to check it out might dig out the old VHS and start watching but uh, th- that's what we have on deck for next week yeah I don't know I I'm trying to keep my options open. It seems like the okay. kind of movie that I would have watched on VHS in like the oh, late I 1990s. See. Okay. I, I was trying to figure out if there was like some reference I wasn't no, getting or no. what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what we have on deck for next week. Uh, looking forward to discussing a lot of these films. Uh, probably, I want to rewatch Boy State. We'll see what happens though. But with that, sure. don't forget to connect with us on our social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff is in the show notes as usual, along with ways that you can contact us through our email and everything like that. We will see you all next week from the Internet California. I'm John Agroni. And for Internet Pennsylvania, I'm Will Ashton. See you next time.